Colonel, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And thank you for allowing us to come out today to see a little bit of what you do. I'm honored to be here. I get to travel the world. But I get to speak to military bases around the world and country. I really love coming here today. So thank you for having us today. I'm honored and privileged to be here. As you know, on January 15, 2009, another tragedy could have happened up in New York City. Instead, a miracle occurred. There were 155 people on the U.S. Airways Flight 1549, and I was one of those that day that were blessed. For the next 30 minutes, I want to share with you that experience. Some of the things I was thinking, and five things that I think really contribute to that outcome whether it was teamwork or leadership, resourcefulness, how to manage your mind through a crisis, or the power of faith, and how certainly encouraged created a miraculous outcome of a very chaotic and potentially tragic situation. <coughs> One thing I'd like for you to think about as I speak, the time that plane took off from LaGuardia, the time it crashed to the Hudson River, the time I got to the hospital, it was only about 30 minutes. And I wasn't scheduled to be on this flight. Because we had a five o'clock flight that night. That day I was working in a distribution center in Brooklyn, New York, and my job as a sales manager. Now, I don't know if you've ever been or worked inside of a distribution center, but they normally open up quite early in the morning. This was about <coughs> two o'clock in the morning. So our day started about five, and we got done at about 10. Now, I travel over 100,000 miles a year of what I do in my job, so any chance to get home to my wife and four kids a little early, I should try to take advantage of that. So at 10 o'clock that morning, I called the travel agent and worked with her, and she put me on flight 1549. So I truly believe that I was supposed to be on that plane for a reason. Nothing extraordinary about the day. It was 11 degrees and snowing. And I was one of the first set of passengers to board the plane that day because of my status with US Air. I was a chairman. I was top tier. So I went back to my seat. It was seat 15A. That's four rows behind that left wing. And I did exactly what I did every single time I got on the plane then. And I hallucinate what you do when you go to a plane now. I went back to my seat, I put the briefcase down, I put my wall in the briefcase, pulled the magazine out, and I started to read. <coughs> then I listened to the flight crew. I did not know where those exits were. I did not read that little brochure that I was telling you to read. But I guarantee you every single time I get on a plane now, I do. Because now I know how important it is to be aware on a plane. It was a little over 60 seconds after we took office when I heard the explosion. And it was a loud explosion. Man, I had never heard anything on a plane like that before. So it got my attention. So I looked up and looked out the window. I saw fire coming out underneath the left wing. So I knew something had happened, but I fly so often, I saw the plane lost an engine. No big deal. It really didn't startle me too much at that moment. See, that's where I think God's grace entered for the first moment on this flight. There's no one in the plane knew at that moment in time what happened on the left side of the plane, also on the right side of the plane. And I truly believe I knew what to cross reference, checked in, what you see, what you hear. It could have been a lot of panic. People panic, people start to lose their heads. When people start to lose their heads, they start making irrational decisions. <clears throat> this day, eight years later, the one thing that stays with me, I've never talked to any passenger on that plane, I'll tell you the same thing. It was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. <coughs> the guy next to me elbowed me and said, hey man, what's going on? I think he's going back to LaGuardia. I felt like Banky, I thought he was going back to the airport. But how fortunate we have a captain who not only had over 40 years of experience, 20,000 hours of flight time, fighter jet pilot during Vietnam, and as important, if not more important, a first officer who also had 20,000 hours of flight experience, a captain with a certified glider expert. I don't play that scope called gliding, I would say me and a 150 for the soldier, possibly the George Washington Bridge in New York. And as soon as he cleared the bridge, he said the only words he said the entire time on this plane. He said, this is your captain, brace for impact. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't pay attention to instruction. I know it's serious. Just give you a heads up. You ever heard that one? Something's going down. It's going down pretty fast. <laughs> that was the moment. I think everything that I learned and everything that I trained for came into play. For the 10 years prior to that day, I was the head of security for a guy named Tony Robbins. You ever heard of Tony Robbins? I got in the video. Well, I had a chance to travel with him. I learned and absorbed everything that he taught. In addition to all the people he was with, so now I have the opportunity and privilege to go around the world and share these lessons and strategies from that day. And my goal for you today is this. You might hear one or two things I'm going to share with you so the next time you face what I call your own personal plane crash, it's probably a fire, a flood, a health scare, whatever that may be for you, you don't be able to survive but thrive and grow from it instead of going into a depressed state like so many people have. There's one thing I've learned over the last several years is this. Those who have the humility to prepare will have the confidence to execute when their moment comes. And as soon as he crossed over the bridge, I did two things. First thing I did is I prayed. I prayed, whoever that captain is, man, just give me that one piece. 
I don't want to come back with multiple body parts. At least I want to come back in one unit. Second thing I pray for is the last person I spoke with, who was my client up in Brooklyn. I called my wife to tell her I loved her. And the third thing is I pray to God to forgive my sins. I don't want anything to mean God at this point. Go down, I want to go up, and it ain't looking good for me right now. <laughs> and the second thing I did is I reached out of my briefcase and got my wallet out and shoved it down into my pants. So something did happen, which looked like it was probably going to happen. At least I could clean my body. I put my head down. It's a little over 60 seconds after he crossed over the bridge when he crashed into the river. And it was a hard hit. He estimates he hit between 100 and 120 miles an hour. That's how hard it hit this was. So when he hit, I went all the way back to my seat and all the way up my seat, just like that. When I came back up, I opened my eyes, I looked out the window, and I saw light. So I knew I had a shot, but I wasn't out. Because you saw the plane landed, the bottom of the plane was stripped off. If somebody actually did listen to the flight crew and went to that closest exit, which may be behind you, try to open that door. So immediately, water started coming in from underneath the plane. Water started coming in from the back of the plane. So depending where you were on that plane, I was towards the back of the plane. Water immediately was your ankle, knee, to waist deep, just like that. Now, a question I get all the time, in fact, I got it last week when I did a couple of interviews. How do these people get on these wings so quickly? I'm going to tell you what happened. As I mentioned, when we hit, I went back in my seat. Some of the seats broke back. When that happened, all of a sudden you saw people get very resourceful and jump up on top of the seats, walking down the seats. That's how a lot of people got out. And about four years ago, I spoke in Providence, Rhode Island for, for a group of bishops and priests, a very unique audience. I get done speaking. One of the bishops come up to me. He says, son, I think those seats broke because of divine grace. And I looked at him and said, sir, I don't know. I don't know. A few months later, I spoke in Groton, Connecticut, where we make the nuclear subs for the Navy. A very cool place. I get done speaking. When the engineers come up and said, Dave, I think those seats broke, but they were designed to break that way. <laughs> so I don't have a clue. Like, any engineers in here? <laughs> yeah, they'll tell you, right? I don't have a clue. So what do you do when you don't have the answer to something? You call the wizard behind the green curtain, right? She has all the answers. And I happen to know who she was, the U.S. Airways. So I called her up. I said, listen, I'm getting this question all over the country. Can you tell me? How did the sea springs? Because we don't have a clue. It is broken. <laughs> That's how most people got out. But I didn't do that. I didn't think about getting on top of the seat. My game plan was get to the aisle, get up, and get out. That's exactly what I thought. When I got to the aisle, something happened. It only changed that day for me. Or probably changed the entire direction of my life. My mom kicked into my head. My mom passed away in 1997. There's something she would tell me when I was a child that popped in my head at that moment. And it was, if you do the right thing, God will take care of you. And the right thing for me was, you take care of other people first. See, I grew up in an area where I played sports and athletics and Boy Scouts, where everybody always had everybody's back. That's just the way I grew up. So I went towards the back of the plane to see if anybody needed help. And once we got everybody out, then I started making my way out of the plane. Now you gotta remember, not only did some of the seats break back, but the bins had broken open, luggage has flown out, you're way deep in the water, and it's dark in the back of the plane. So every time you took a step, you hit something. At that point, you can see it was a piece of luggage or it was somebody's body. I'm doing next slide, please, sir. But all the further I could get up <coughs> is 10F. And the first picture that was released on Good Morning America was me, the bald-headed guy, trying to get out of the plane. <laughs> when I got there, that was an amazing sight. There was no room on that wing for me. There was no room in the boat for me. But it was an amazing sight. People were already being rescued. I don't know who said this, and I give them 100% of the credit who ever said it. They said that Skiles and Sullivan were already down that day. The crew and passengers got already out that day. But the real heroes of the day were the first responders. And the first of the first responders was the New York waterways, the ferries. They were there about two minutes after this plane crashed. There's a lot of ways to define America. But having someone there to rescue you, after a plane crash and ice cold water in just a couple minutes, that's the start of a miracle. Now, if you look at this picture really closely, you notice I'm holding on to a lifeboat. And the reason why is this. I don't know, anybody here knows anything about the Hudson River? I've learned a lot about it the last few years. It's got a very fast current. This plane actually floated down the river about a half a mile in 24 minutes. <coughs> so this little lifeboat kept going in and out from the plane, and they, like, ah, who reads the instructions? No one does. It's actually tethered to the plane. But no one knew that. So they kept yelling, hold on, hold on. So that's why you see me hold on to a lifeboat, waist deep in 36 degree water, 
about seven minutes. But I sort of whipped around, looked out, and saw something on a wing that caught my eye. There was a lady. She's going on to a baby. In fact, I found out later she actually had two kids on this plane. She had a three-year-old on that lifeboat. A three-month-old she was holding on to. She wasn't moving. She was stifling. My first thought was, man, if she tries getting on this lifeboat, slips, gets in the river. And you got to remember, that always a 36-degree water. But you've got jet fuel all over the place now. And I don't know if ever walked on jet fuel. It's slick. There are people sliding all over the place. My thought was, slips, river. Then my next thought was, how am I going to get out of here? She's standing in the middle of the wing. She ain't moving. So I did what just came naturally. All the trade I had. You got to do something really radical to get bring somebody out of the state. So I yelled at her. I yelled, throw the baby, throw the baby. And Kaylee, I didn't think she was going to throw the baby. I don't think that's a thought she was going to, she was going to do. What happened was I got her attention. And she looked at me and she was like, what? But it's amazing where people are in times of a crisis. Because now if you look at this picture really, really close, you see a blonde-haired lady with her head turned to the right. She just happened to be a mother of three from Knoxville, Tennessee. She heard me yell this at this lady, who looks up at the lady and says, give me the baby, give me the baby. And all of a sudden, she gives her the baby, jumps on the lifeboat, and all of a sudden, you see people walking down the wing. That lady lives in Manhattan. She sent me this package now about four, four plus years ago. When I first got it, I had two things in it. First was a note that said, thank you for helping my family. But the second thing was a picture of the doctor, <coughs> the baby that we all worked together that day. Say, I don't think I did anything that spectacular. I only throw the baby. I don't think that was one of my finer moments. You see my mother that was probably tell you my son is pretty stupid. I don't think the lady from Knox would do anything that spectacular. I think the lady who gave up her baby is something pretty special. It's just like how much faith. Talk about a definition of faith. To give your baby up. To some guy who's yelling at you. Some lady. You don't know. You give your baby up. That takes a lot of faith. But I'm still on the plane. <clears throat> Things are happening all over the place. There's something about people from New York and New Jersey. Anybody here from New York and New Jersey? They get a bad rap. The thing about people in New York and New Jersey, they know how to do one thing really, really well, is respond. But unfortunately, they've had to respond to things before. So they don't sit around and wait for someone to say, now you go over there and you go over there. They just start going and they start figuring stuff out. And one of those guys happened to be a tugboat captain. I got a chance to talk to him. He said they put an all call out, all, all boats go. But he brought his tugboat out and he said he had a plan. He told me his plan was he was going to bring his, his tugboat, close to that lifeboat, throw a rope over to it, have them tie it on, pull the little lifeboat over his tugboat, clean up the situation. Great plan. What he wasn't planning on is people standing on a wing. And he couldn't pull the boat across. So he got beeped out. See where the boats are coming in from the front of the plane side. He got beeped out. So he had to back out for the next boat to come in. He didn't get his job done, next boat coming in. So as he was backing his tugboat out, he hit the front of the plane. But Kaylee, that's not that big of a deal unless you're on the plane. And I was on the plane. But we're six, seven minutes into this thing. I'm waist deep in the water. And I'm sure some of you folks here have seen the tugboat. They're big, heavy boats. And when it hit the plane, it sort of shook the plane. When it shook the plane, I felt water going on my backside. And the first thought that I had was Titanic. Remember that movie? And that boat tipped up and sucked everything down in it. And my first thought was, man, you'd not be sucked down in a plane. You're this close to getting out of here. You'd not be sucked down in a plane. So I stopped here and think my mom and my dad. Because if they didn't give me swimming lessons from the American Red Cross without a child, I may never be able to get off this plane. And that's one of the biggest lessons of that day is this for me and everybody else. All of us had this one kind of experience. See, I get a chance now to talk to college and high school. I love talking to college and high school. But I talk to youth. And I, you know, I don't know if you have kids. I got four kids. I don't know if you ever tell your kids to go do something and they look at you like you're a crazy person. Like, well, you want me to do what? And I tell these kids this. I think, just think of this one moment in time. If Captain Sullenberg when he attended the Air Force Academy, does not learn how to glide a plane. Me, 154 of the souls and possibly the George Washington Bridge right here. Folks, somebody else is talking to you today. If my mom and dad don't make me learn how to swim, I'm not here today. Because one of the biggest lessons that day is this. All these things we learned all of our lives, 30, 40, 50 years ago, one day you may have to use that one skill to save yourself or save somebody else. The skill Sullenberger had to use that day gliding. The skill I had to use was swimming. As soon as I felt like I'm out of here, so 
So I jumped in and swam to the closest boat that I could find. It happened to be to that wing. Anybody here seen the movie Sully? You have seen the movie Sully. Cool. You see this ferry over here has a metal ladder. The, the ferry in the movie Sully had a plastic ladder. I went, got, I went to one of those, had a plastic ladder. So when I got there, they're yelling, climb, climb, climb. I yelled up, can't, can't, can't. <coughs> well, so my mom started talking to me again. Because the word my mom hated most in life was the word can't. See, if you grew up with my mom, and you said, I can't to my mom, she said, if you can't do it, you're going to do it. Her whole world view was, if you can't, you must. That was my mom's world view. So I got one arm up, I felt somebody grab it. I got the other arm up, I felt somebody grab it. To this day, I do not know who these two gentlemen are. But they pulled me on one of those ferries. Threw me over the side, and now I saw it on the ice on the ferry. I don't even know what's going on now. They yelled me, get up, get up, get up. All of a sudden, I got up, and I'm like, man, I made it. But I didn't. Because that was the moment. You know, I don't know if you've ever been in 36 degree water. I've never been that. If you have, it just takes everything out of you. Now, if I talk to firemen, they, they will correspond and they'll tell me exactly the same thing. And you see these firemen, right? They're running into the fire all day long, right? The next picture you see of a fireman, when you see that, they're sitting on the curb, right? Nothing left. I had nothing left. I, had, I was so cold. I can't explain how cold that water was. I was so cold. But once again, it's amazing where people are in times of a crisis. Because there was a guy on this ferry, he had a gray suit on, he had a laptop over his back, but most importantly, he was dry. But what did he have? He had an iPhone. And he walked up to me and put this in my face and said, call your wife, call your wife. I couldn't dial the phone, but I couldn't get the number out. And if iOS 10 is working right now, you will hear what was said that day from the ferry while all stuff was breaking loose. That's all I could get out. This is your dad. I've been in a plane crash. And my wife's not waiting for me to give her a blow by blow what I do. She actually had a life. She's actually taking our son to basketball practice while this was breaking out. So my daughter, who then was a junior in high school, was when I got that message, turned the TV on, saw this breaking loose. And that's how my family was notified that I was in a plane crash. Anybody here not been in New York or New Jersey? Anybody? A few people. Quick geography lesson. This picture is great because it tells you pretty much where it all went down. So look at this picture closely. In the middle of that picture is the Empire State Building. The big building to the left of that is Manhattan. So if over there is New York, the other side of the river is Jersey. And four years ago, I spoke in New Orleans with a man who wrote the plan for maritime rescues of the Hudson. See, that plan was written. They just got the plan and executed. And he and I did a talk in New Orleans, plan execution talk, two-hour talk, very cool talk. I learned a lot of things. One of the things I learned was pretty basic. Whatever closest point to shore you were is where you're going to go. So if you look at the picture, the left side of the plane is facing towards Manhattan. The right side of the plane is facing towards Hoboken. I'm heading to Jersey. And I found out later they radioed ahead because I knew that I'd been in the water. So when we hit shore, there were three people waiting for me. There were two EMTs and a gentleman from the American Red Cross with a blanket. And that's why I speak now all over the country for the American Red Cross. But the little known fact about that day is this, which you will not get in the media. This is bonus information. There were a lot of groups that touched a lot of people that day. There were two groups that touched every one of us. The ferries and the Red Cross on both the New York and New Jersey side. I couldn't walk. So they picked me up and carried me to a triage center. And if you've never seen a triage center, I'm sure you all have. There's nothing in it, right? This is, this is a room. They put me next to the wall, stripped all my clothes off down to my skivvies, and Heather, my EMT, says, I'll be right back. But I'm going to floor my underwear. I didn't even know what's going on now. I look over here, and this guy is sort of like I am. I look over here, and this girl didn't have any underwear on. But it's amazing when you're on the floor naked with two people. Everybody's sort of looking, but no one's talking. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing now? I look, I'm naked with two people. What's going on now? And also, I see this gentleman walking toward me. He had a card in his hand. He came up and said, Sir, I need your name. I need your date of birth. And he writes on the card. He takes my right ankle, and he walks away. Now, I don't know when y'all grew up. I grew up in the 70s. There's a TV show called MASH. <laughs> they take your toe, they're carting you out. It was game over. You didn't make it. You're going to the big casino. You're done. That's exactly what I thought. It's like that movie Ghost. It's true. Watch yourself die. I'm watching myself die right now because I was on the floor. I was naked. I was ice cold. I could barely breathe. And I had a tag in my foot. I must be dead. And then all of a sudden, Heather comes back and says, got to take your blood pressure. Shoo, good blood pressure. One blood pressure. Now, fortunately, it was 190 over 120. She goes, we have a good stat. Now, I've heard that one on TV. When they say stat, you're going someplace. She goes, you got to go stat. You have a heart attack or trick, you got to go right now. And I'm thinking, 
I survived the plane crash. And I got out of the water. And now I'm going to die of a heart attack or stroke. Man, it just keeps coming. Now they wheel me out. There's people in every place. They're taking me to the ambulance. But a guy from NBC with his camera had his story. Last passenger out. So he's following us with his camera. They put me in the ambulance. He's jumping in the ambulance with us. They're pushing him out. He's trying to get in. There's chaos in the ambulance. Can you go to the next slide, please? So they take me a couple miles away to a place called Palisades Medical in Jersey. And once you get people in New Jersey, get a bad rap. When they open up the doors, all of a sudden there's like 20 or 30 people waiting just for me. And all of a sudden, 10 women, gentlemen in the room, listen to this, 10 women come running up with blankets. Because what I found out later what happened was the gurney got stuck. So the women blankets picked me up, carried me to this bed where there was a doctor. And how it is go time, because now the doctor's going out orders. He yells, yells out blood pressure. Once again, 190 over 120. That ain't good. He yelled out oxygen. They said 75. I didn't know what that meant. I found out later that's not good. He yelled out temperature. He took an orally was 96. And he yelled out analine. Also, I got that one right. I know what's coming down, whether I like it or not. It's coming my way. You know, I have no control over this one. And Nurse Bautista, who's on my right arm, who's my angel, she took great care of me. Screams at the doctor. I can't get him off. I can't get him off. Because what happened, I found out it was this. My body was so cold and so wet, the underwear was sticking or frozen in my hips. I've got scars on my hips today. It's like my battle scars. I wear I guess. So what do nurses always have? Scissors like this long, right? She goes, clip, clip, rip. And all I got left is my watch. Because my temperature was 94. That's why they diagnosed me with hypothermia. And it took them five hours to warm my body up. That was an amazing five hours. Now, the only day I get to meet the former governor of New Jersey, the head of Port Authority, New York State Police, New Jersey State Police, Homeland Security, FBI. They want to talk to me, and the gentleman was on my left. He was the first passenger out. And you saw the movie Sully? He was the guy who jumped out of the door on the right, fell flat on the water, fractured his sternum. And the reason they wanted to talk to us is this. Once again, a little known fact, which was not an immediate bonus information. I have 150 passengers, not counting crew, passengers. Ten of us went to the hospital. Seven went over to New York City Hospital, like Beth Israel and Columbia, those city hospitals. Three went to the Palisades over in Jersey. I was 10 people. Two people stayed the night, Barry and I. 148 people walked home just a couple hours after a plane crash in ice cold water. So you go back and watch the videos from that day if you ever do it. You notice, and you saw a little bit of the movie. They didn't know where everybody was. They couldn't get a final count. So it was about 8 o'clock that night is when the governor of New York came out and said, this is truly a miracle on the Hudson. That's how it got his name. Because they couldn't find everybody. But the authorities knew where we were, and they had questions. And one of the questions I got was, do you think this was a terrorist attack? Because if you have a plane going towards a bridge, towards Manhattan, somebody has to answer questions. And if you saw in the movie, which is very accurate, they locked the crew down. You know, you, no one got to the crew. No one even knew who the crew was that night. They locked them down. So we were getting these questions all night long. But all night long, I kept telling the doctor, I have no clothes. I have no clothes. And the doctor kept saying, well, why do you need clothes? You're in a hospital. See, I did not know you did not need clothes in a hospital. I did not know these two things together. Right? <laughs> what he didn't know is this. Not only did all the authorities know where we were at, but the media did. And we read Good Morning America, the early show Fox and Friends, and all I had to wear was my watch. So somebody from the Northern Jersey chapter of the American Red Cross, well, I guess a really ugly sweats for me to wear that next day. And if you go back and watch the videos from my interviews that day, you'll see those sweats, but that told me something. Somebody cared. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you have nothing. I'm talking, you have no clothes, you have no money, you have no friends, you have nothing. And then somebody goes out and just gets you a stitch of clothing. It means a lot. Now, when something like this happens, every airline's got them, their emergency response team, and each one of us got our own liaison, our own person. Mine was Doreen from Pittsburgh. And Doreen flew in overnight, and Doreen had one job, take care of Dave. That's all she had to do was take care of Dave. So all night long, I finally called my wife. She's trying to make some plans, get some food in there, the whole thing that everybody forgot. So all night long, we were doing this, and she's trying to keep people out. So the next morning, I go down and do these shows. She's going to put the range getting me back to Charlotte. So I come back. I'm feeling pretty good now. I'm warmed up. I've ate something. I'm going to go. And she looked at me and said, listen, I don't want any more stress on you. I'm going to put you on the 12 o'clock flight home. I said, no, I'm going to go home now. She said, no, you don't understand. I said, no, you don't understand. I said, my family is at the airport. My kids are probably freaking out. I want to go home now. She said, no, you don't understand. She said, you are in Weehawken, New Jersey. You're going out of LaGuardia. 
It's almost 9 o'clock. The flight leaves at 10. I can't get you there. Well, I told you the night before, everybody wanted to be my friend. They all left their car and said, call me if you need anything. And I cashed in. I'm going to tell you right now who the most important person is in New York City. The director of Port Authority. Davis Carter said, call him. He said, he'd help me. She said, call the director. I said, call him. He said, he'd help me. She said, I thought you were melting down on me. Freaking out. I called the director of Port Authority. She went out the director of Port Authority. Six minutes later, I had a police escort. We're taking from Weehawk to New Jersey to LaGuardia in 16 minutes in a pimped out Escalade, me and my hoodie. I said, that is a miracle. If you had a chance to take a police escort from New Jersey, Dude, man, that take it. There ain't nothing like it. 16 minutes flat. It took me two and a half hours a couple months ago, right? You can't get from New Jersey to New York. So now we're pulling in, right? There's media everywhere. So do one quick game. I just want to go home. So I go up to TSA. Like, I have nothing to check, right? Let's go. But we all forgot one critical detail. Me, I'm part of this crowd. I didn't have an ID. What if we could do TSA without an ID? Homeland Security guy's car to TSA. I played it. He looked at me and said, sir, why don't I call the director of New Jersey Homeland Security? So he knows who I am, please call him. And he did. And I got the New York security out an ID. TSA will tell you that's a miracle. Try this over the airport. I don't have an ID. See what happens. They don't play around right now. So now I have the entourage. Everybody wants to walk with me now. So now we're walking down to the plane. And there's a little commotion. They walk me right on. Sit me down in first class. Oh, this is pretty cool. And all of a sudden the captain and the first officer come out. I said, what's going on? He said, well, we deboarded the plane. We wanted to talk to you. We never talked to you, but you survived a plane crash. We want to talk to you. So now they're having a one-on-one -on -one interview, right, about what happened the day before. But what they weren't expecting is this. They had questions for me. I had questions for them. Are you going to get me over the bridge? Are you going to get me home? Right? And the captain looked at me and said this. He said, so, sir, I do not have body experience. I said, whoa! And that was the first time I heard this, that all these guys have gliding experience. He said, well, I won't get you home safe. What I'll do for you is this. We hit 3,000 feet, and that was the first time I ever heard that. That's all the plane ever got was about 3,000 feet. I'll ring the bell, and you and I'll sort of know where this happened. So you put me back in coach. I did not get first class. I got free potato chips, free coach. We took, <laughs> Beth, the flight took great care of me, right? Left the middle seat open. I put the hoodie up like the Unabomber, and I lock it down, right? So I was locked down. I hear ding, ding, ding. I look out the window. I was like, man, 3,000 feet's not that high up. And that's when everything started coming back. And that's the moment I started realizing what was going on. <laughs> Not only did I realize what Captain Sullenberg was amazing, the guy's a stud, but Jeff Skiles did the first officer. He and I spoke together in Chattanooga a couple months or a couple years ago. From the plane, back of the plane talk. A very cool talk. I learned a lot from Jeff. One thing I learned from him was pretty basic. And you saw, if you saw the movie, this will validate what you saw in the movie. The first officer has a book up there. How do you get down from like a mercy from 30,000 foot book? And he did it from 3,000 feet. He like telling Sullenberg step by step what was going on. He's as much a hero as Captain Sullivan. But no one ever hears about the second guy in command. <coughs> He's that humble lieutenant, right? No one ever talks about him. He's as much a hero as Captain Sullivan. So now we're on our way back to Charlotte. I haven't talked to anybody but Beth, the flight attendant. But about, you know, they make the final call, and the guy two seats over from me opens up page four of Newsday. What is on page four of Newsday? That picture. <coughs> she starts looking at me, he's like, hey, were you that guy on that plane? I'm like, I'm like what? So he turns and shows me my pictures and said, my man, my pictures in the paper. He goes, you were the guy in the plane, right? So now he, everybody here, as he gets up, looks at the freak show the hoodie in the back, right? Now who's the guy in the back, right? Everybody's getting up. We're all following the scent. Last time we were following the scent, it didn't really go very well for me. And the flight says, get down, get down. So Beth runs up says, are you okay? So just get me off this plane last. Just get me off this plane last. So when we landed, no one got by Beth. Beth's like my angel, man. She stood there and no one got by Beth. But Beth escorted me off the plane last, and yes, my family was there, and he was there always, but also the CEO of the American Red Cross in Charlotte was there with my family. And it runs out was the most important thing that happened in this two-day period. So I've had the honor and privilege of been to Fort Hood. I got to go to Oklahoma after the tornadoes a few years ago. I got to go to the eastern shore of North Carolina after Superstore Sandy. Now I get a chance to do something. I get a chance to talk to people. One thing I find out is this. People like me get taken care of, but often the families are the ones who are usually forgotten. And she was taking care of my family. That's why I speak so passionately for the American Red Cross. They were there with my family. But that's where my miracle turns into my mission. And I want to end up and share with you how a miracle like this turns into somebody's mission in their life. Back when I was first in sales, I did something then that came, I didn't know it was smart or not, but it turned out to be one of the smartest things I ever did. 
I found that mentor, that person who can take you out of the wings, give you their 50 or 60 years of experience, and you can compress their experiences down from decades down to your days of execution. And I met him. His name was Bill. When I first <coughs> met Bill, Bill had wore a final shirt and drove a pickup truck. Yeah, what I found out about Bill is this. Bill owned 80 movie theaters in North and South Carolina. Bill was a multimillionaire. Bill was like the Sam Walton of Charlotte. He took me under his wing. So one day I called Bill. Hey, Bill, I want to be a leader. How does somebody be a leader? I'm young, I'm fast-tracking. How can somebody be a leader? He gave me one of those life lessons. He said, you want to be anything in your life, put yourself around the peer group you want to be like, and you will elevate your standards to do that. And you will become what you want. So, okay, how can I fast-track this? I'm a young guy, right? Just how can I get to the bottom line? So I went to a business seminar in San Diego, California, for business leaders. So I show up, paid 4000 bucks. My wife thought I was crazy. But I got there, and one of the things on the agenda, they called a mission statement. The family, I didn't know what a mission statement was back in the early 90s. But I paid 4000 bucks. I'm all in. So we get there, and on that day, it was October 4th, 1994. And I write this. I, Dave Sanders, to see here, feel, and know the purpose of my life is to be happy. Realizing I accomplish anything I desire, and I have faith in my creator, inspiring others to be the same. And I put it down. And he said, don't look at it for six to nine months. You'll change it. Just immerse yourself, right? Tell. So I did exactly what he said, because I paid the money, right? All of a sudden, six nine months later, I look at it, I'm like, man, I'm a loser. I'm not doing any of this, and I can't tell my wife. <laughs> All of a sudden, January 15, 2009 comes. That, that mission isn't realized. <coughs> Sunday after the plane crash, who the next slide was? Sunday after the plane crash, I went to my church. Now, that Sunday, everybody wanted to talk to me. But there was one guy who really wanted to talk to me. He was in charge of men's breakfast. They came up to me and said, Dave, will you speak at men's breakfast next Sunday? I said, no problem, man. 50 old guys eating pancakes? Got it. Walk in the bar. I know they invited half of Charlotte. Five, six hundred 600 people show up, and they run out of pancakes. They have hungry, angry Methodists. That's not a good combination. Not <laughs> argument for the Baptists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians, but the Methodists. Anybody here Methodist? You got to have food, right? You show up, you better have food. So now I'm freaking out a little bit. So I go behind the church and say, God, give me something to say, man, and give it to me now. Deliver it. <laughs> And he gave me something to say. So I got done speaking, and two gentlemen went to talk. One was from Bank of America, and one was from Wachovia. Man, no problem with that. They feel like, oh, it's cool. I look in the back of the room, I see this elderly lady. And she's like locking me down, man, just staring me down. She makes her way up the aisle, grabs my arm. I like, what's she going to do to me? Like, I don't know what's going on now. But she looked me in the eye and said something. Only changed that day for me, but changed the entire direction of my life. She looked me in the eye and said, I was questioning. There really is a God. And I don't believe in miracles. But you, you, you're a physical evidence that there is a God. And he does miracles. Thank you. Thank you. So let my arm go, look me and I one more time. Walk away. I'll whip around, look at these two gentlemen. I've never seen two men cry like this in my life. My minister is behind me, so I'm like looking at him like, what's going on? But a few seconds later, it came to me. What happened to me on January 15, 2009, and that will impact somebody. Before she goes to her great beyond, wherever that is, please, there's a God who does miracles, because I am physical evidence. So when, when they invited me to be here with you today, <coughs> spend the morning with you, there was no doubt that I was going to be with you today. I don't know what I'm going to impact. Go back to 2009. There wasn't a lot of positive things happening in this country. But all of a sudden, you had a captain, a crew, and passengers that did something that had never, ever been done in the history of aviation. One team, one goal, one miracle. They gave people hope. <coughs> There's a passage in the Bible that says suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. And that's what only happened that day. That's what I get to do every single day. And that's what you get to do every single moment of every single day. That's why I honor what you do. See, one thing I've learned over the last several years is success leaves clues. You know, if you want to get anything in your life, find people like yourself who have done something, do what they do, and you will see get the result. I'm going to end up and share with you a lesson about leadership that I learned that's impacted me more than anything in my life. In 1999, I had the high honor and privilege of escorting a gentleman named General Norbert Schwarzkopf. You ever heard of Schwarzkopf? This group mm -hmm. probably has heard of Schwarzkopf. A lot of people have. It's amazing. And I got a chance to escort him. We were in Hawaii. So I, this is a pretty big honor for me. Being around a four-star general, pretty big honor. I've never been around this kind of grass before, right? So here I am with you. I had him the entire morning. 
So I, I, well, as we were walking around and going around, I said, General, may I ask you a question? Do you really want to know? You just ask it. I said, well, I just want to ask a question. He goes, go ahead. I said, how did you win that war in Iraq so quick? And he gave me a pat answer. See, all these guys have their pat answer, right? If you answer it a thousand times, you got your answer down. You know exactly what he's going to say. So I said, General, may I ask you another question? No one ever asked the General a second question. He goes, go ahead. I said, sir, how did you really win it? And he looked at me and was like, pretty audacious. No one's ever asked me that. He said, I'll tell you. He said, every day I show up in the theater, I get questions. Women couldn't drive tanks. Women had to cover their heads. We had, they had to pray five times a day. I kept reminding my <coughs> troops, how does this contribute to kicking Saddam out of the way? Said, That's all I did, is remind the troops of the mission. That's what told me why he didn't go into Baghdad. It wasn't the mission. Fast forward, 2009, after the plane crash. I'm in the green room at the early show with Captain Sullenberg. A bunch of us were there, but this is the first time I had a chance to talk to Captain Sullenberg. So I went up to the captain. I said, Captain, tell me, man, how'd you do it? He goes, I had a mission to get that plane down with zero fatalities. And I started thinking a little bit while, like, well, I heard something from Schwarzkopf. I heard from this guy. There must be something about leadership. And also I started putting this thing together. It's like, these leaders, the top leaders, what they do is set the mission. Get out of the way and let people execute the mission. A course correction, but let them focus. You focus on the mission. That's what they do. So I actually developed a program called Mission Focused Leadership about all these things that these leaders I've learned about, how people set the mission, and then they, they actually step back and let people like you execute the mission. That's why I honor what you do. Somebody has to set the mission, but you guys actually do it. And that's why I learned about leadership. Step up, set the mission, and let people do what they do best. So, Colonel, I'm honored to be here today. I am blessed to be here today. Folks, I, I can't tell you how happy, excuse me, except my knee, is happy to be here today. I want to, do we have time for questions? Do you want to do questions? Do we have any time? <coughs> yes or no? Before I end up, I'm going to open this up for questions, but I'll say this. May God bless you, and may God bless the Air Force and National Guard. Most importantly, right now, may God bless the United States of America. I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much for having me. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.